Hello, you're live on Joy News today on your most authoritative news portal, Joy News, independent, fearless, and credible. We are coming to you live from our Kukumleme studios here in Accra. We're also live on DSTV channel 421, Go TV channel 125, and around the globe at myjoyonline.com. Remember to also catch us live on your digital TV set because we are free to air. Now, in the headlines... Minority says it will go ahead with its planned Occupy Bank of Ghana protest despite police rejection of proposed route to be used by the demonstrators. Details as the NDC says it will not heed their demand. Now, South African company Petro SA fights off claims of ripoff in its acquisition of an oil field in Ghana, which resulted in a standoff between board chair of GNPC, Freddie Blay, and the energy minister. Upon Prama Forest Reserve, among several other forest reserves, still being heavily exploited by illegal miners, contrary to recent assertions by the president, that all reserves are being heavily protected against Galamse activities. We have excerpt from our upcoming hotline documentary, The Forest Siege. Also, bad roads in the Dambai district affecting livelihoods of residents. We take you to the community to get a sense of how disturbing the situation is. And later, we bring you business, news, sports and showbiz all coming in the sun. My name is Carlos Caloni. Now, the minority in parliament insists it will go ahead with its plan occupy of Bank of Ghana protests using the same route they proposed to the police. The Ghana Police Service, after a meeting between them and the minority yesterday, rejected the route chosen by the minority for its Occupy Bank of Ghana protest. Now, the police warned the organizers to use a different path and destination for picketing in the interest of public order. But the protesters will not budge. We'll hear from one of the leaders shortly. But first, my colleague Samuel Mbura gives details of the police statement indicating their rejection of the proposed route. The organizers of the protest gave the frontage of Parliament House through to Osu Cemetery Traffic Light, Ministry of Finance High Court Complex, uh, to Kimbu, Makola, and Rawlings Park, as well as the Opera Square, which the protesters will end at the premises of the Bank of Ghana as their proposed route. But after a security assessment of the chosen routes and the destination for the picketing yesterday, it drew their attention to the fact that they using their selected routes may endanger public order and public safety among others. Meanwhile, the police has indicated its readiness to provide them the needed security to exercise their constitutional right to demonstrate. It therefore requests the organizers to change the routes and destination of picketing in the interest of public order, public safety, and running of essential services. The Ghana Police Service assures that it is waiting to hear from the organizers to enable the provision of the necessary security during the protests on the 5th of September. Let's now listen to MP4 Boku Central Mahama Yariga, who says they will not heed the police directive for them to use alternative route. He spoke to my colleague, Mami S.A. Thompson. So we rejected their proposal and insisted that we will go through the route that we proposed. Then in the evening, we received a letter from them, totally deviating from even their own original proposal, and then simply saying that we should start our protest march from the frontage of Parliament House, and then, you know, march to Independence Square and, and stop at Independence Square. We find that very ridiculous and unacceptable. We are going to march, we are going to march along the same route that we have proposed, and they have a constitutional and legal responsibility to give us protection and protect all those who are along this route for us to march this way to the bank and return. 
they have nothing to show that the central bank building the Security Zone. There's no law that determines the Security Zone. In fact, the office of the President, the Jubilee House, which everybody can testify that, I mean, that was a piece of government. We have protested to the country and they have come out of the institution. So we don't see why the central bank building can be treated differently. In any case, the money is not just the central bank. They are just the regulators. They don't keep any money there. I believe that the only thing of value there is that those the expensive watches that they have bought for themselves. So much to the birds of God. They don't have any intelligence. It's absolutely untrue. There's nothing that indicates that we cannot march long ago. So if, if those goods are not safe, then nowhere in Accra is safe. So if, if, if we cannot demonstrate there, then we cannot demonstrate anywhere. We have worked with them in the past. We have demonstrated and we have provided security along the same route that we are proposing today. What has changed? What has become ungovernable about Accra that those routes that in the past we could use are no longer safe for us to use? If they say that, then they are indicting the government and indicting themselves. Because I don't see what has changed for us not to be able to uh, march along those routes. The Interior Ministry says security operational protocols are constantly being strengthened, especially along the borders, to address heightened insecurity within West Africa. Deputy Minister Nana Iyakwansa says the ECOWAS subregion is still troubled by acts of terrorism and political instability. She spoke at passing out parade of the Ghana Immigration Service held in Kumasi. I am told that the graduates demonstrated commitment and encouraged throughout their training as they were taxed daily with demanding physical and mental exercise which aim at which aim at preparing them to endure various forms of pressure in the execution of their duties. Nananom, ladies and gentlemen, the ECOWAS sub-region is so troubled by acts of terrorism and political instability driven lightly by cop detacts. The efforts of, the, of these unfortunate occurrences are felt by all nations in the sub-region. In the response of this, the Ghana Immigration Service continues to strengthen operational protocols, especially along the borders to ensure security of the nation's border. Through the support of the government, the service now has two additional schools. These schools are the Immigration Tactical Training School in Chebi, the Immigration Service Mid-Country Training School in Tepa. Plans are far advanced to expand the training facilities of the service by citing extra training schools across the regions to enhance capacity burden at the entry and post-entry levels. South African petroleum company Petroese says its latest acquisition of an equal split in the interest held by GMPC's subsidiary Jubilee Oil Holdings Limited is structured in a manner that will yield mutual benefit for all partners involved in the deal. Ghana's Minister of Energy, Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, made the CA took a swipe at Ghana National Petroleum Corporation GMPC Board Chairman Freddie Blay for offering Ghana's fields to the South African country, insisting that the deal is not in the interest of Ghana as the nation will lose revenue. Now, the minister further ordered Mr. Blay to withdraw the offer immediately. However, Joy News is learning that the differences may have been ironed out, paving way for the petroleum company to now proceed with its commercial activities with an expected announcement of first oil production in September 2023. Speaking in an exclusive interview with Joy News' Blessed Soga at the 15 BRICS Summit in Johannesburg, South Africa, Group Chief Executive Officer of PetroSA, Sandisif Nkameni, noted that the South African firm is committed to the new partnership in Ghana. I think what is important is to highlight the value of partnerships. And we are committed to the partnership in Ghana. We continue to work with our, um, our fellow colleagues and partners, including the Ghana National Petroleum Company, to ensure that the solutions that we uh, pursue together lead, lead to a benefit across the board. Um, I'm encouraged that uh, among the areas we are, we are partnering on, we are due to announce the first oil in September, so we'll be part of that. And I think, again, it's highlighting the value of the collaborations on the exploration and production side. So I think that's really positive. 
positive and it's something we should not shy away from also celebrating. I believe that the opportunities are also across other parts of the value chain. Uh, the downstream business, for one, I think provides an opportunity. Uh, with me here is also our group executive who leads our international business. And there's been a lot of focus around how we support the downstream uh, business and sector in Ghana. And I think that's a space as well that we want to expand through partnerships, just to mention a few. So you're willing to invest more? Indeed. I think partnerships require investments. They also require that we understand as we bring ourselves together as partnerships what is the value proposition we are bringing forward what is the outlook in the immediate term and as well as the longer term I think those are some of the areas of alignment that become important to be able to harness the partnership talking about the very first production that's happening how many barrels are we doing and will you show up the numbers based on the very first indeed so perhaps the context is there is already production from that particular college there's additional uh, production that we're anticipating as a result of the well work that has uh, taken place. I think that's the value we are highlighting. So it shows the sustainability in that investment and also commitment to growth and a longer term outlook in terms of the partnership itself. The Economic and Organized Crime Office has been justifying its move to clamp down on suspected stolen vehicles from the US and Canada, which are shipped to and sold in Ghana. You will recall in April this year, Yoko directed all vehicle dealers and individuals in possession of 95 luxury vehicles suspected to have been stolen and smuggled into Ghana, which had been frozen through a court order to hand them over to the office before May 31, 2023, or face the wrath of the law. The move created a lot of panic among vehicle and asset dealers, with many having to search vehicles out of their garages for keep. Now, the Vehicle and Asset Dealers Association has not been happy about the development and have insisted Yoko takes a step back until it concludes its investigation. Well, while at that, Yoko, at a recent meeting to outline its five-year strategic plan in executing its mandate, has further emphasized its resolve on the clampdown on the suspected stolen vehicles. Here is the Director of Operations, Abdullahi Bashiru, speaking to the issue. This, this is the position of Yoko. Then it's indeed unfortunate. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if you listen to even the introduction of Madame Tua before this gentleman came in, he said that if information that if an investigation is being conducted, the media shouldn't go, you know, by it and then do the application. They should Yoko is a crime fighting agency. Ghana Revenue Authority has a mandate to collect revenue for government. Now a crime is committed in the US, in Canada, and then there is a, a crime but there are collecting factors. Some of the collecting factors are in Ghana. Now our collaborating partners, being the API among others, have requested you to access it. And mind you, our law allows collaboration and cooperation. The vehicles stolen, mind you, some of the victims of the vehicles are even murdered. Some of the vehicles are obtained through car hijacking. Some of the vehicles are obtained through stealing, so a crime has been committed. Now they brought in the cars into the country here. Our tax laws are said that it matters not or uh, where the source of the vehicle or the uh, commodity is coming from. Once the product or the commodity is within the contemplation of the law, it's obligatory for the taxman to take the duties. Whether or not a crime has been committed to obtain a vehicle or not, it's not the responsibility of the taxman. In other words, it doesn't behoves the GRA to investigate to know whether a particular item being brought into Ghana or shipped into Ghana is stolen or not. We apologize for the earlier swap of that video. But what's the current situation with the acquisition and sale of the said vehicles among the Vehicle and Asset Dealers Association in the wake of the clampdown? Clifford Anso is executive member of the Vehicle and Asset Dealers Association. If this is the position of Europe, then it's indeed unfortunate. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if you listen to even the introduction of Madame Tua before this gentleman came in, he said that 
if information at stake and investigation is being conducted, the media shouldn't go, you know, by it and then do their publication. They should rather allow the uh, institution to do their investigation before publication. So if it's come out with this, this statement now that people collaborated with other partners also in the US and Canada, and as a result, people even lost their lives. And these cars were brought here. So if these cars were brought here, as we say, they have been mandated to deal with this crime. They have been mandated to collaborate with international partners as they are saying now. To sit out those that they suspect that these people were the people that we suspect that collaborated with people in America to commit this crime. Have they done that? The answer is no. Based on the categorization that you also stated, I mean the gentleman also stated, he said that when these when these cars were fixed, the people that have their documents indicating clearly that they bought them as citizens genuinely are there. Those also who went to their offices without any documents at all on such cars are also there. And then number three, those also who bought from garages. Who did not know, but rather went and bought this car from garages are also there. Joy News can confirm some forest reserve are active with irresponsible mining, contrary to President Akufuado's assertion that all reserves have been cordoned and protected. The president in January this year said the country's forest reserves are under the protection of the security agencies. But a trip to the Upper Prama Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region indicates extensive devastation of the natural resource, even at the time the president was making the statement. In the face of a series of documentaries titled Forest Under Siege, Erastus Asaridonko put the spotlight on the Apamprama Forest Reserve. In January this year, President Akufuado gave assurance that all forest reserves have been cordoned off and protected. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources has, through the agency of the Forestry Commission, with the assistance of the military, made the effort to cordon off all 294 sites of forest reserves in the country and rid them of illegal mining. But even at the time of making that statement, the Apamprama Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region was being pillaged by Chinese miners and their Ghanaian collaborators. Today, one cannot distinguish between the Odahun, Kobro, Obuyakwa, and Benenebin sections of the Apamprama Forest Reserve. The devastation stretches deep, revealing the depletion of thousands of hectares of this major carbon filter for Ghana. This miner tells us he works for one Emilia, who we later learned is a politician. Other miners are not happy that her equipment were left out of a recent onslaught against illegal mining in the forest. When the soldiers came, they met one of our excavators on the road and they bent it. These equipments belong to Mama Emilia's group. She's a former women's organizer for MPP at Jacobo. We don't know why they did not bend her equipment. The chief of Kobro, Nanayao Enin, tells a story of how he and his elders were treated when they confronted soldiers guarding illegal miners in the forest in 2022. On Monday, I, my linguist and some of my elders took a trip deep into the forest. We met a barrier manned by armed soldiers. This was in 2022. I introduced myself as the chief of Kobro and caretaker of the forest for Bekwai Paramountsi. I told them we've noticed some activity in the forest. We demanded to see their documents so we could inform the king of their presence. The soldier called the owner of the mining site on phone and told him of our presence. His boss told him to ask us whether the forest is owned by the government or the people of Kobro. We couldn't challenge the armed soldiers, so we left. 
and the boat you near the Mafi. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko Kumasi. Now, residents in the OT regional capital, Dambai, are angry about the deplorable state of their roads. The contractor working on the Dambai town roads, joining new sources, say had abandoned the job and left site due to financial and some contractual issue. This has also made work to be stalled at least two critical roads in that region. Peter Seno has more. The My Town Roads were scheduled for completion at least before the end of 2021. By September 2020, most of the culvert works were done by city construction. As of August 2023, this is the state of affairs of the My Town Roads. Even the very street leading to the residence of the regional minister is that terrible. This is as a result of works abandoned by the contractor due to financial and contractual issues. The study school is a cause for worry for residents at the regional capital. This road should have been completed in 2020, but it has been left till now that gravels have been poured on it. The state of the road is really worrying. We are asking government to fix it. It is really worrying us. How to move from the other side to transact any business is a challenge. How to commute from home to my shop is a problem. The mud you see now is the same dust you see during the dry season. Oh, this time, no. I'm saying that you're on. Sahano peta musuzum futuro. Futuro, what do I do? I don't know. Unti minto, bibia poto. We just have said, can we be sure? Minister, can we say can or no? Can we be sure? No. Can we any kura 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 kura? If we say kura, we just have any afu we go can or so no. That's the minister's car. The muddy gravel is making things worse. Pregnant women could have miscarriage or even die if they want to access health facilities in the area. If they want to fix the road, then they must do it well, else we will block the road. Even the minister cannot go to his residence. <laughs> Now, staff of the National Identification Authority has petitioned the governing board of the authority to review and reverse the grant for his dismissal. This is coming barely a week after the NIA dismissed 10 of its staff for abuse of their office. One of them is Martin Ekewa, who says his all-in crime was reporting to work earlier than usual to register the unusual overwhelming Ghana card applicant. Michael Ashley has one. The National Identification Authority has dismissed 10 staff members following investigations into allegation of misconduct, extortion of funds from Ghana card applicants. Excepts of a statement from the National Identification Authority announcing the dismissal of some of its staff for misconduct, extortion and manipulating the registration system for personal gain at some of its offices, including the Lang Quantana Municipal Office. The allegations against the dismissed officers included demanding and accepting unauthorized fees from Ghana card applicants, as well as manipulating and registration system for personal gain. Some of the affected people are fighting off these claims. In Medina, we had a peculiar issue because we were occupying the offices of uh, the, uh, the Ghana Revenue Authority. Martin Akowa is one of those rejecting the grounds for his dismissal. Um, as a team, we needed to have a strategy on how to decongest the small space we were given in the GRA office. So it required that um, we come in a bit early to take care of those two appointments. The GRA applicants who were coming in to get Ghana card instead of 10. And bosses sending through applicants through me to assist in registering and issuing Ghana cards. I must put on record that I 
never instituted that early working hours for my personal gains. I did it purposely to decongest my office because the office was a small space given us by GRA and they were constantly on me that uh, Ghana card applicants had taken over their entire office and they were not hiring any office for Ghana card applicants. It's the office they've given me a space and so it was so wrong my applicants had taken over the office. Prior to his dismissal, he stayed home for nearly 14 months after he was interdicted in April 2022. It was very difficult, coupled with the present economic situation in, 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 in the country. I have a wife, I have a family who sometimes depend on me, and so it was very unbearable. Uh, it, 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 it took every fiber of me out. I was devastated as because my only crime was starting work earlier than 8 a.m. Martin has petitioned the NIA governing board to investigate and review the grounds for his dismissal. So I've requested the authority to, to send me a copy of uh, the record of proceedings. And I've again gone on to petition the NIA governing board. Um, I'm trusting in the abilities and the competencies of the NIA governing board to come through for me. And so um, the cases with the NIA governing board, so, if they have not even acknowledged receipt of my letter. But I'm still believing their competencies and abilities to come through for me. Martin plans to seek redress if the governing board fails to respond soon. For Joy News, Michael Ashali. Now, some delegate of the MPP in the Quadaso constituency say they endorse the vision of former Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Osu Afriyakoto, to create a chain of party-owned jobs for its members. They believe this can help deal with the creeping apathy in the party as some party faithfuls cry neglect. The supporters of Dr. Afriyakoto believe the MPP may fail to win the 2024 general elections if solutions are not found. Nana Yaojima has more. A press conference was organized to galvanize voting support for the former Kwaraso MP in his flag bearership ambition in the NPP's Superdelegates Conference. Dr. Efria Koto's policy to create party businesses is expected to generate revenue to effectively manage the party, with some members being employed under the models. By the plan, the businesses will be managed by a holding company to his supporters, the success of the program in other countries shows its viability. Ernest Frempon is spokesperson for the group. He has given us a classical example of countries that are practicing and is working for them. I spoke about uh, the ANC of South Africa, which is the most common political party all of us can bear with the RPD at Rwanda. They all have practiced it and it is working for them. It is linking the, the party to the government. And this is a very essential thing and a, an innovative thing. Now when it comes, it's going to help the party and it's going to help the, the, the delegates in this country. According to the group, the former Agric minister, through pragmatic policies, revamped the cocoa sector and promoted non-traditional food and cash crops. They tout policies such as planting for food and jobs have proven Dr. Efi Akutu's competence. Akutu speaks for itself. Dr. Efi Akutu is the best performing Agric minister in the, in the Fourth Republic. In 2021, the agri sector grew around 8.4 percent, and it is unprecedented in the history of the republic. I'm not saying that the facts and figures are there to, to demonstrate for everybody to see, and this is the reason why we are saying that Dr. Officer Kuto is a competent and he can lead the party and represent our party. You see, this contest that we are going is about what you have done for the party, what you did in office, and your vision for this country and the party. And Dr. Joseph Yakuto has demonstrated in all angles that he's competent in all angles to serve our party and this country. For Joy News, Nana Yaojima reported. Now, Elections Committee of the Governing New Patriotic Party has put on hold all party activities ahead of the Superdelegate Congress on Saturday. This move, uh, according to the committee, is to ensure a transparent, free and fair election process. Samuel Mbura of our political desk joins with some details. Uh, Samuel, run us through the critical part of directives by the committee contained in the latest protocols for uh, actually conducting the Super Delegate Congress. The executive committee have been asked to suspend any previously planned programs, including but not limited to workshops, training, extended meetings, retreats, 
residential retreats or any events involving delegates campaign for the duration of this week until the conclusion of the electoral college election. Considering this, it is anticipated that there will be no provision for a public address or occasion for any national party executive, government representative, or regional executive to publicly address delegates on the day of the voting. Emphasis are that there will be no Congress on the day of voting, and voting will be strictly walk in. On security arrangements, the exclusive oversight of security matters rests with the police, and access beyond security parameters uh, is restricted solely to duly accredited delegates, mm. aspirants, committee members, or their representatives and agents of the aspirants. Uh, but with regards to the conduct of the election itself, the committee reiterates that it has entrusted the entirety of the electoral procedure to the electoral commission with the paramount responsibility of ensuring a transparent, free, and unfettered election. Mm. Um, delegates are therefore expected to carry their identification cards and to verify their names at the initial security checkpoints and strongly advised to conform to all the electoral laws, regulations, and rules, especially not capturing, uh, capturing images of cast ballots, which is strictly prohibited all and right. constitutes a breach of electoral regulations warranting punitive action. All right. Thank you so much, my colleague Samuel Mbura, giving us those details there. Let's still stay on the MPP because campaign team of Vice President Dr. Mohamed Obamia is fighting off claims that government appointments have been coerced to support his candidacy. According to the team, being a vice president does not automatically make him an established candidate in the contest. President who contested in 2008. We didn't call him establishment candidate. Why are we calling this one the establishment? Is it because the president supports him? Because the president himself has come out categorically that I don't support anybody. Many of them who are sat here with me that that's why they don't believe the president. Look, do you know Afri Akuto? Yes. He's a boyhood friend of the president. Do you know Boachia Jaku? Yes. He was the campaign manager for the president of two elections. Huh? And, and then you, you can ask Kamalaji Pong, who also saw a campaign got, manager of his. So, <laughs> any of them can, be, can have the president's support. None of them have been his Unless the president categorically... President. Sorry? None of them have been if his have, vice I've said there has been a vice president who was not classified as an establishment candidate. So, being vice president automatically doesn't mean you have the president's support. Look, I... I'm an appointee of the president. I support Baumia. I have told you why. When we, we, I, we go to the campaign, I see a lot of government appointees like myself. And I'm happy. Now, I'm happy that these people are also on the campaign. Now, I do not think any of them is supporting Dr. Baumia because the president has called them and asked them to do so. How is it possible in the NPP that you can coerce anybody to support it? Can, can I be coerced? And I take myself as an example. Now, finding places to charge your phone when the battery runs down can be a daunting task. Though sometimes a nearby store comes in handy, it might be reluctant to share the power. What if there's a charging station where a 50 peso coin can give you, say, about 30 minutes of power? Now, these uh, uh, Sunyani Technical University students have come up with such innovation. Love FM's Kwesi Debra speaks with Fidaus Abdul Karim for Tech Thursday. Okay, this one it works like when you get there, all you need is a crane and it takes in 50 pesos, one city and two cities. And the lights here is 50 pesos is blue, one city is yellow, and then two cities is green. So when you get there, you slot in your crane like this. 
the Ukraine has entered, so it gives you the number, of, uh, the many, the many to charge. And this one, fifty percent gives you one city to charge. As you can see, my phone is on. It means it's charging. So when the time is up, it will disconnect automatically. So when you want to charge it for one, one hour, thirty minutes, you have to slot in one city. And as you can see, I have one city here. You remove your phone. If not, it will not charge. You slot in your one city. As you can see, it has entered. Plug your phone and it gives you one uh, 30 minutes to charge. We take a short break, we'll return with business. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communications, GIFEC, is advancing ICT-driven solutions to the myriad of Ghana's development needs. The fund hopes the rollout of the data transformation agenda will augment the government's investment in science, technology, engineering and mathematics activities. There's more in the following report. GIFEC, with the support of the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD, the International Telecommunications Union, and Cisco, has rolled out interactive ICT-driven training programs for teachers and peoples in Ghana. Through a digital transformation centers project, which began in 2021, GIFEC hopes to lead the way in helping Ghana find an antidote to its environmental, agricultural, and economic woes through ICT Profess Solutions. Initially designed to develop basic and intermediary ICT skills of beneficiaries, the program has trained over 1,200 children and about 180 trainers leading to the establishment of 30 coding clubs across the country. They were introduced to STEM-made kits provided by IoT Ghana. GIFIC has adopted the phrase, catch them young and they shall be yours forever, to train the next generational thinkers who will use ICT to solve Ghana's issues. Chief Executive of GIFIC, Prince Ofosusefa says, the time to cash in on ICT is now. The computer, all right, uh, is a machine that basically is set up to take some instructions, right? So you tell or you code the instructions and then you're able to have the computer do what you want it to do. When we talk about coding for kids, we're basically talking about interactive, interesting, creative programs that allow us to uh, expose the children to coding at a very early age. Uh, interest in uh, computing and STEM in general uh, also increases. He spoke at a graduation program in robotics for the teachers who will in turn train other beneficiaries at Nkwantakesi in the Ashanti region. Alex Kojobo is the National Project Officer for the International Telecommunications Union. Um, the, the he talks about um, progress we, we made so far on the coding project. The, what coding helps us to do is to solve our everyday pro problems that we see around us. Think of sanitation, transportation, all the pro problems we see around us, especially for us as developing countries. Um, the role of coding and data transformation is to help um, use ICT to address some of these. Some beneficiary teachers shared their experience with Joy News. We use the code to instruct the device to perform an action. A smart senses that when you are going to a room, you are able to, the room will be able to open for you. From Nkwantakesi in the Ashanti region for Joy News, Oimitiria reporting. Now, over the past decades, jollof rice has become a dominant meal among West African dishes, although it originated from Senegal and was called wolof. Now, in the wake of the entire craze about the delicacy, 22nd August was adopted as World Jollof Day. As part of activities to mark the celebration, leading culinary brand Onga has organized the third edition of the annual Onga Jollof Battle in Accra. Beverly Broom was there and filed this report. This year's battle themed online influencers edition saw six content creators showcase their culinary skills as they battle for the jollof supremacy in the sizzling hot onga kitchen 
Head of Corporate Communications and PR at Promacito Ghana, Gideon Kudo, indicated that the event reinforces Onga's position as the number one food seasoning in Ghana. I mean, as a brand, we are committed to uh, providing good quality products that delivers in the ports. Uh, but at the same time, too, we are very much interested in giving the best of marketing experience and brand experience to our consumers. A typical is uh, the event that we are organizing today, in addition to the numerous cooking competitions that we do organize. So, Onga Jolov Battle is here to stay. After a fierce battle, food blogger and dentist Ellen Che Baffo emerged winner and took home the ultimate prize of 15,000 Ghana CD with products and souvenirs from Onga. Here is winner and first runner-up of the contest. I feel very, very proud because I've worked for this. Yes, because when I had a call to you know, participate in this thing, I tried cooking four times, making beef jollof, goat meat jollof, chicken jollof, and it wasn't to my expectation. So I went with the chunks. Everything about Onga is super B. Uh, and that's business bosses up next. Good afternoon. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News today. Now, Ghana's biggest art festival, Charlie Water, moves from a local sensation to a cultural tourism with hundreds of foreigners trooping across the world to participate in the creative festival. Joy News' Jackie explores the festival's growing reputation as a global epicenter of artistic hub where the vibrant tradition of the past meets the future. This year's Charlotte Water Festival is not only providing a pool for cultural creatives and enthusiasts to exhibit their craft, but also an avenue for patrons to experience the culture and art in Ghana. Here is what patrons from South Africa and Nigeria had to say about the Charlie Wate Festival. Because this is one of the biggest festivals of its kind in all of West Africa, so we couldn't, you know, wait to come and experience it in person. Okay, I'm looking forward to see art, music, culture, all of that, all the beautiful things. What do they even think about Ghana? Gosh, jollof rice? I'm joking. <laughs> Everything. Ghana is literally, I mean, this is my third time coming to the country. Okay. I love the food, I love the people. It's one of the most enriched places in terms of culture. There's just a vibe here, a spirit of, and an energy here that I just can't quite get enough. I think the people, apparently there's a vibrancy and a warmth to the people here. And so far everyone's been like so warm and so receptive, so I'm excited. Nice thing about Ghana. I like how patriotic Ghanaians are. Oh, Nigerians are not patriotic? Ah, Ghanaians have an edge, that's what I would say. Yeah, they are more patriotic. The festival hasn't ended yet. To these patrons, they are here for it all. For Joy News, Jacqueline and Suma Yabwa. That'll be all for showbiz here on Journey Today. There's more showbiz news in our subsequent bulletins. My name is Becky. Good afternoon to you, Carlos. Good afternoon, Becky. And for more news, log on to our website, myjoyonline.com. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Carlos Galoni. Have a great afternoon.